morning, church. Great to see you. Great to see you online. Those who are joining us from afar, awesome to have you with us as well. There she was, celebrating her 100th birthday. Her name was Ruth Bryant, and all of her friends had gathered at the assisted living, and they brought the big cake, and they had the balloons, they had the candles, and they were blowing out lots of candles, lots of candles, blowing them out, and everything was going just fine. Everything was going perfect until the cops were called. <laughs> Who calls cops on a 100-year-old lady's birthday party? Well, evidently, somebody called the cops, and he showed up with handcuffs, and in a loud, stern voice, interrupts the frivolity and says, excuse me, I am looking for Mrs. Ruth Bryant. And all eyes turned toward that poor 100-year-old lady sitting there. And he marched right up and says, are you Mrs. Ruth Bryant? Well, yes, I am. And he handcuffs her to her walker. And he says, I have a warrant for your arrest if you'll come with me now. Just one problem. This sweet old fireball wasn't going quietly. And she began to fight with the police. She even kicked one of them. And he said, he said, ma'am, please don't kick me. I have a bad knee. And without missing a beat, she said, yeah, I've got two bad knees. Deal with it. They put her in the back of the cop car, drove her downtown to the county jail, took her inside, gave her fingerprints, gave her the, the orange jumpsuit, and just as they were putting her into the slammer, the clink, and shutting it, they all stopped and turned and took a selfie. Evidently, one of the last things on Miss Ruth's bucket list was to get arrested for something. It didn't matter what, but she knew her tomorrows were fewer than, than uh, her yesterdays, and she wanted to knock that off her bucket list. So what about you? Do you have a bucket list? Do you have a list of things that you want to do before you kick the bucket, or maybe things you want to do before you're not sure you will see another tomorrow? See, we're, I call this message today, the sun will come out tomorrow, because we, not only because we had Annie up here all weekend, and we're going to have newsies this way, it's so incredible. I can't, I'll tell you all about that in a minute, hopefully, we'll, we'll get to that, but the sun will come out tomorrow. Somebody needs to hear that, okay? One way or another, I'm looking at you at home, hear me, the sun will come out tomorrow. One way or the other, either it'll come up like we've known it, or the Lord will return, and we will have a new heavens and a new earth. If you read Revelation 21 and Revelation 22, but here's the best news, okay? Don't miss this. The sun, the S-O-N, he already came out. He came out of the tomb. The tomb is empty, and that changed everything. Death didn't hold him. There were no little handcuffs that the enemy could put on him and say, sorry, <laughs> good try. He broke the chains of sin and death, and shame, and guilt, and all those things that hold us back, all that, all that, that baggage that we carry, and we walk around with furrowed brows, we look like we've been baptized in vinegar and lost our best friend, and somebody kicked our dog, and we're thinking, why doesn't people want what we have? Because we don't look very redeemed, and we're so stressed out, and I think we lose our perspective. So I want to hear loud and clear, once and for all, everyone say, hey, the sun will come out tomorrow, and that alone gives us hope. Death has been defeated. The tomb is empty, and we're going to look at something different from a whole new perspective. So if you brought your Bible or you're following along on your digital app, pull up Matthew 28. Matthew 28, we're going to look at verses 1 through 6, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll check a few other translations here. I want to look at the, the original Greek and the uncorrupted text here. It's just so, so full of truth and power. Matthew 28, everybody got it? Starting in verse 1, it says this, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. By the way, the other Mary, most scholars think that was the mother of James the Lesser, in case you're curious. Who's this other Mary here? Verse 2, there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook, and they became like dead men. Remember that. We're coming back to that. Verse 5, the angel said to the women, don't be afraid, for I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And I love, love, love the message translation. Listen to this, starting in, in verse 2, I believe. He says, suddenly the earth reeled and rocked under their feet as God's angel came down from heaven, came right up to where they were standing, 
He rolled back the stone, and then he sat on it. That is so cool to me. Shafts of lightning blazed from him. His garments shimmered snow white, and the guards at the tomb were scared to death. They were so frightened, they literally couldn't move. You ever been that scared? And I love this next verse. Then the angel speaks to the woman and says, <laughs> there's nothing to fear here. Did you catch that? There's nothing to fear here. Why? Because of the empty tomb. Because of the resurrection. Every time I read this, I find something new. I see some new hidden truth grenade that just explodes, cacao, right in front of me, and I'm thinking, thank you, Lord, for showing me truth in something that I've glossed over 8,000 times. Notice something here that people miss. Notice how the stone was not just slid over a little. Like, let's pretend this was the tomb. The angel didn't come up and was like, oh, good night, this tomb, this stone is so big. I'm going to try really, Mary, I'm going to pull, and you run up, and I want you to peek in, because I'm going to give it just a little sliver, okay? You're going to have a, you're gonna, yee, get in there. Can you see him? Do you see, do you see the shroud? He's in there. He, he's gone. He, it wasn't like that. In fact, John, in the original Greek, uses a word that says he literally picked up the stone, carried it away, and heaved it. He heaved, y'all, remember we did a study on this a few years back? The stone was estimated to weigh 2,000 pounds. That's a Volkswagen Beetle. And the angel had no qualms picking it up and discarding it. And then for added emphasis, this is so cool, he sits on it. He's like, yeah, take that, devil. It's so awesome, the power he displays. Boom, to drop something? I mean, it's just right there. It's so powerful, all this stuff. But here's what I love. Notice what the angels say. The soldiers were like. It says they shook with fear as dead men. They became as dead men. Some translations literally say they collapsed in fright. They were fainting. They were literally passed out. So I want you to think, when is the last time you were that scared? Can you think of the time you were the scaredest in your entire life? Did you ever pass out? Like co completely collapse? I've had two episodes where I was so scared. If we had time, maybe I'll tell you this story, but where I was truly frightened beyond belief. But I never fainted. I never was so, pa it's like the fainting goats. Anybody seen fainting goats? These things are awesome. They're so adorable. Got their big ears like, whoop. and then you come up, you clap or you're scared and they go, whoop. <laughs> and they, they just pull right over and they go rigid, rigid stone cold. They're still alive, but they faint and it is the most adorable thing. That's kind of how I picture these tough guys, these guards right here. I kind of picture them. Here they are. They're living, they're breathing. They're assigned to watch a dead man. So you know they're yawning. They're thinking this is the most stupid assignment why are we here having to guard, in their mind, a corpse? You've set a seal on it. You've got 18, 15 guys, depending on your, your count, of Roman trained soldiers who, upon penalty of death, if anything disturbs this, they're, so they're here and they're taking shifts and they're guarding it, and they're thinking, this is the most worthless assignment. This is so routine, so boring, so don't miss the terrific irony that Matthew has when he writes this. Notice here, suddenly, the angel shows up and these suddenly alive guards look dead, and the dead man is alive. Is that not rich? Is that not, well, talk about the ultimate truth grenade of irony. The living men now have become like the dead man, and the dead man is now alive. In fact, he's more alive than ever. Talk about a switcheroo. The angel shows up, Jesus is alive, it's all hibbity flibbity plickety plack cacao boom and now everything is turned upside down. And it is so amazing how these elite guards are not intimidating this angel at all. Because notice what you probably missed, because I did. Notice when the angel arrives, he doesn't even acknowledge the guards. Did you catch that? Totally ignores them. Doesn't even give them a glance. Look who the angel pays attention to. He looks at the woman. It's incredible. These guards, these tough guys, they were not intimidating to this angel at all. You ever been around a bully? Think about middle school. Maybe elementary school. You ever get bullied? You ever know anybody? I tell you what, in my, my, my elementary school, we had a, a gang of bullies, and I could not stand these people, right? They were like sixth grade, and I was in fourth grade, and I mean, I, I would walk to and from school, and I can remember it like it was yesterday. I'd be walking up the hill, and I would see this group of four or five guys, and I could, I could tell you to get the ringleader's name was Tori Alvarez. I could, Tori, I forgive you. And I remember... <laughs> 
walking, and I would see these guys, and I was an easy target, I'll admit it, because I chose, for whatever reason, I didn't play like the trumpet or something, I chose the cello, the cello to a fourth grader, and I'm lugging this thing up the sidewalk, and here they come, like, oh, please, sweet baby Jesus in the manger, no, not these guys today, and I, how do you hide with a cello, and I'm sitting here like, can I get behind a tree, is there anything, and they would pick on me, and they were relentless, and I couldn't stand there, come up and shove me and stuff, and Finally, I must have talked about it once to my older brothers, because on one particular day, they followed me from afar, and I didn't know it. And my older brother, Tim, who was a weightlifting dude, played on the basketball, the football team and stuff, and I'm walking, I see them coming. I don't know he's there. And I'm like, doo, doo, doo. <laughs> oh, here they come again. Here comes a push and shove it. From around the corner comes my big brother. Hey! Quit picking on my little brother. Why don't you pick on somebody your own size? I cannot tell you how tall I stood in that moment. I was like, yeah, why don't you pick on somebody your own size? These four guys come up around Tim, and he's like, he's like, it's not fun pushing on people that are half your size, is it? Leave them alone. Like, yeah, well, you're bigger than me. I kid you not, Tim literally got down on his knees and said, throw it. Throw the first punch. He says, I'm not going to throw a punch. You'll just get up. He said, if you throw the first punch, you won't get up. Leave my brother alone. Y'all, I was 17 feet tall in that moment. These kids were not intimidating my brother. And these punk guards at the tomb were not intimidating this angel at all. You see why I love this story so much? Those guys never bothered me again. They broke those, those chains of fear because I knew somebody bigger than me had my back. And it was so powerful. Then I loved the interaction. Ignoring the guards, the angel looks at the woman, and look what he says. It's so tender, almost gently and calmly. In verse 5, he utters the most amazing, hope-filled words. He says, don't be afraid. Isn't that amazing? Those are the exact same words the angel said when Jesus was born. Did you catch that? Don't be afraid. I bring you good news, a great tidings. Y'all remember that? He's saying it again. Don't be afraid, for I know you're looking for Jesus. He was crucified. He's not here. He has risen, just like he said he would. Y'all don't believe it. And then he says, just for assurance, he says, you want to see inside, little girl? Come on, come on. Come look at the place where he lay. And it's this beautiful, tender moment. And then he sends them out, and they change the world. They're so bold because of this. They see, they see the shroud wrapped just like a body had dissolved through it. He has been transfigured, glorified body, and everything has changed in this moment. So I got to ask you, has it changed anything for you? Has it changed anything for me? Before I was a Christian, I knew all about this story. I knew all about the resurrection. I could probably teach it, even though I really honestly didn't believe it. I've heard about it. Off and on going to church, I kind of could, could relate the story and maybe even defend it if I had to. But it was just one tiny problem. I didn't understand how the resurrection of a man 2,000 years ago affected me today. And it became clear when I was being invited by some friends to come to church. I'm so glad they did. And I was listening to some messages, and the youth pastor called me aside. He goes, hey, listen, I hear a lot about you. You know, thanks for coming. You know, you got long hair. You're a little weird, a little skinny. But why don't you come in here, and we'll talk some. I hear you sing. I'm like, yeah, I do sing. He's like, oh, well, maybe we can do that. I was like, dude, if you need me to sing, I will sing anytime. I'm so ready. And he said, well, I'm glad you suggested that. Can I ask you one question? Sure. Tell me your testimony. <laughs> My test what? T test tubes? T well, I don't understand what this testimony He said, your testimony. Tell me how you came to know the Lord. You know, are you a follower of Christ? I'm like, uh, I do not know what you're saying. He said, no problem. Come in here. For the next several weeks, he invited me to his office with my friends and shared Jesus. And I remember he would always come. He knew we were starving high schoolers coming out, getting up to school at 3.30. He'd take a, a bin, a giant vat filled of yogurt-filled raisins, the weirdest thing, but I was hungry. And he put them on the table, and we would just devour them. And he would talk. And he was discipling me in the ways of Jesus without me even knowing it. And it became very clear as I started listening to him that I knew all about Jesus, but I had never met Jesus. I had a great head knowledge. I could tell you all about it. I could tell you about his disciples. I could tell you all kinds of facts and figures, but I didn't know him here. And there's a difference. Even the demons know about Jesus. 
but there was no heart change in my life. I, 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 I knew I was fallen. I knew I had sinned. I knew there was a separation between me and something holy, something greater than me, but I didn't understand how to overcome that. That was the resurrection. Because he overcame death in the grave, because I surrender to him and I say, Lord, I'm sorry, I repent of my sins. I agree with you. Remember we talked about this last week. I agree with you on the hideousness of my sin, and I'm going to turn and willfully follow you. Will you come be my Lord? Will you invade my spirit? Holy Spirit, will you take up residence and seal my heart? Because he didn't have to remind me before knowing Jesus I was fallen and immoral and corrupt and greedy and selfish because that's how we were born, from that original sin. Do you have to teach a child how to whine for its own way and cry? Give it to me. No child ever wakes up and says, I understand, Mom, if you'd like to wait to change my diaper. I understand that you haven't slept in seven days. Would you take care of yourself first, Mother, Father? It doesn't happen. They cry and they scream. They want their way. I mean, it, is, it is inherent in us. But when the Holy Spirit takes up residence, we become different people. And aren't you glad? The Bible says, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How's that happen? It's not in our flesh. There's no way. It's like we still have these chains in your own flesh. You can't overcome sin. If you could, then there would be no need for the cross. See, we make a mockery of what Jesus did if we didn't really need it. Wink, wink. You see how this plays out? So we have to come to the end of ourselves and say, God, I agree with you. I have messed up. I am separate from you. I need that restoration, that relationship. And one of the most encouraging passages in all of Scripture is Ephesians 1.19. And it says this, The same power that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in us. The same power. Did you catch that? Not a similar power. <laughs> Not a very close replica of the power. I remember a few months ago, I got to take Milo to our very first car show. Went to the Cars and Coffee. And Car Anybody ever heard of that or been to that? Yeah, you've been there? Oh, yeah, you know. I know you know. That's, man, that place is wild. They haven't been able to have it because of the pandemic. And when they finally did, they had like 300 cars show up. And we were walking around. Milo's like, oh, Dad, what's that? I'm like, that's a Model T. I didn't even know they still had those around. That's a Model A. That's a Dusendorfer. And that's a Blickenschlopper. And there's all these crazy cars. And we turn the corner, and a shaft of holy light comes down from heaven. A sparrow lands, and I hear heavenly music. And I see, in all its glory, a Lamborghini Aventador. Oh, it was, yes, yes, with a V12 engine. Oh, man, you're preaching my sermon. Thanks. Y'all, we came up to this, there wasn't just one or two. There was four of them in a row, and they were gorgeous. I looked at that, I said, Milo, for $300,000, you can have one of those. It's like, wow, Dad, did you ever have one? I'm like, nope, <laughs> nope, not on a pastor's salary. Not with a retired school teacher, not doing it. I said, but that's okay, because God broke those chains. I don't have that lust material things. I'm, I'm over it. So I'm sitting there drooling, I mean, looking at this Lamborghini Aventador, and they've got the, the engine compartment popped open, and inside is a V12. I'm like, a V12? Who does that? Gets like 0.8 miles to the gallon. And I said, Milo, look at this. I said, $300,000, you can have it. Or for $30,000, you can get a replica. They make those? Oh, yeah, it's called a kit car. It's a replica car. And what you do is you get the kit, you get a good mechanic, not me, you get somebody who wants to build it together, and they put it, and from a distance, I'm going somewhere with this, woo, from a distance, they look identical. But as you get up closer, you start to see slight imperfections. But here's how you really tell the difference. You ready for this? You pop the engine compartment. And instead of seeing that roaring V12, there is a four-cylinder Pontiac Fiero engine. <laughs> Seriously, that's what they use, the Pontiac Fiero chassis. I mean, so you're at the stoplight, and these two pull up side by side, and to the, av the average person, you're like, oh, wow, look at those. Vroom, vroom, and this one's going, wee, wee. So it's not like a scooter, you know, mm, going by. That's not the same power. And sometimes we forget if the Holy Ghost has taken up residence inside us, it has given us the, quote, same power that rose Jesus from the dead now lives in us. Y'all, that, do we grasp that? That changes everything. Not only does Christ coming out of the tomb and resurrecting and being death, not only is that a change and forgive our sins of the past, it is the guarantee for our future. 
It is because he conquered death, we know we can conquer death. We can come back from the grave. He has sent us the comforter. He said, behold, I'm going to my father, but don't worry, I'm sending you the comforter. The parakletos is the word he used. I'm, using, I'm sending this to take up residence to seal you. It is literally the down payment. It is the deposit. If you are a, a, a house buyer, I remember Amy and I bought our first house. We were so excited. Holy cow, we had no business buying that house. It was built in 1901, Okay. And it was a money pit. But I didn't know. All I knew was it was awesome. We walked through all starry-eyed, holding hands like, this is it. It's our dream house. Look, at this is great. We can't afford this, but we want it. And the realtor's like, okay, are you serious? I'm like, yes. What do we need to do? We'll take it. And he's like, well, the first thing you need to do to show you're serious is you need to put down some earnest money. Do some due diligence. Man, I reached my wallet. I said, done deal. What are we talking here? 20 bucks? 30 bucks? He said, uh, be a few thousand dollars. Just put that away. What's that? Oh, yeah. If you're serious, you got to show it. You got to put down a few thousand dollars. There's a lot of people who will put their name on this list, but those who walk the walk are going to put down serious money to show I mean business. Oh, that's what the Holy Spirit is for. He came to take comfort, to take up residence, to not only give us comfort, but to show us how to live like the Lord, to show us how to live in Christ. When we put our trust and our, our faith in him in the finished work of the cross, and we say, God, I accept your blameless sacrifice in my place, he says in that moment, you are a new creation based on scripture. That's Romans 6.23 right there. When you accept the free gift of eternal life and you say, I can't earn it, I'm not good, I don't clean myself up. Again, if we do that, we make a mockery of what Jesus went through. If we could do it on our own, then we don't need Jesus. Do you see how everything hinges on it? And why it's so important when he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. His words, right? Not ours. He is everything. The empty tomb is everything. Because we know we have the guarantee, the Son will come out tomorrow. For us as Christians, we don't have to fear death. The Bible clearly says, these things I have written to you so that you may no, you have eternal life. Isn't that awesome? You may know it. You don't have to hope or guess or pray or wonder or debate. You don't have to get on Facebook and say, what do y'all think about this? Don't do that, by the way. You can know your faith is secure. This week, we've been hosting the Carolina Academy of Performing Arts, also known as CAPA. And it has been awesome. In fact, I think we have, we have the director and her family back here, Melanie and Spencer Prince are back there. It's so good to have you guys with us as well. We got some other people. This guy here on the front row. Oh, I see several on the front row here. Y'all, you need to see Neely and Ben. These guys can do acrobatics while singing and dancing. I saw them do a flying leap, a quadruple flip with a Lindy, a spin, while playing a trumpet and singing in Latin at the same time. It was incredible what these guys can do. There's so many incredible musicians and actors and dancers coming up here and doing such incredible things last night. In fact, Band, I'm going to have you guys come on up and get in place. We're going to sing one last song before we go. But I want to I share this story with you. If you are into singing, you might remember a very famous story about a well-known opera singer named Ruthanna Metzger. And Ruthanna Metzger was this phenomenal professional singer. And because she was so good, it wasn't unusual for her to be asked to sing all the time at weddings, at national anthems, sporting events, and different celebrity shows, and all these private parties. So she didn't really think it was out of the ordinary when she got invited to sing at a wedding for a very famous celebrity who happened to be a multi-multi-millionaire. She didn't share the name because she didn't want a name drop, but she shares this story. She says, I knew it was going to be incredible, and I was so happy to participate because I knew the reception was going to be out of this world, and I could eat and eat and eat. She said, when the invitation came for the reception, I knew this was a once-in-a-lifetime event because of where the reception was being held. It was being held in Seattle in the top two penthouse suites of the tallest skyscraper on the West Coast, the Columbia Tower. And it's one of those beautiful ones where you're up and it's got this circular glass wall that goes up two flights. And it's, these two floors are separated by a glass staircase that goes up to a second penthouse suite where all the food and all the dining was going to take place. And you were looking up, and you could see rows and rows of cars going in the sunset and all the headlights going, and the coast was over there. And you're looking down 
on the tops of the next tallest skyscrapers. That's how high up you were. And it was breathtaking. And she was so excited. She sang at the wedding. Everything went great. And there she shows up at Seattle's Columbia Tower, and it was even more impressive than she thought. She said she knew she was in for something sweet when she was surrounded by these gorgeous men in black tuxedos, all coming up with these trays of, not appetizers, hors d'oeuvres, right? That's fancy for appetizer. I'm not talking cheese sticks talking the the fancy shrimp cocktails and stuff where they hand out all these drinks, anything you wanted, and you have to like have your pinky out to drink it because it's so hoity-toity and high class. And she is loving this, and her husband Roy is beside her, and they're having this great time, and an hour goes by, and the atmosphere is absolutely luxurious, and people are having a great time, and someone rings a bell and says, the bride and the groom are on their way. And they take this ribbon, And they go to the stairway, the glass staircase, and they hang this ribbon up, and they bring someone out to cut it. And they say, now, let the real party begin. And they cut it. And a man comes up to the top of the stairs, and he has this beautiful leather-bound book. And he's standing there, and he says, file in. And they begin to come up one by one. All 200 guests start crowding this glass and crystal staircase. And they come up, and one by one they tell her their name. And it gets to Ruth, and he says, may I have your name, please? And Ruthanna says, yes, it's Ruthanna Metzger. And she says, okay, hang on one second. He looks, he says, I'm not seeing your name in the M's. Can you spell your name for me? She says, M-E-T-Z-G-A-R. And he looks again, and he looks up, and he says, ma'am, I'm so sorry, your name is not in this book. If your name is not in this book, I have no choice but to decline your invitation. She said, oh, you don't understand. There must be some mistake. I'm Ruth Anna Metzger. You just heard me sing, right? Were you at the wedding? I was down at the other cathedral, and I sang this beautiful song. Look, I'm friends with the bride and groom. If you'll just go find them. And he said this. This is a quote. Okay, don't miss this. He says, ma'am, it doesn't matter who you are, or what you did, without your name in the book, you could not attend this banquet. She said her face fell. She looked around the room, and she started thinking, if I could just find the bride and the groom, and she was looking for him, but then a hundred guests were still crushing in behind her, and a hundred others were already getting seated, and she noticed that every table had a name tag, and the bride and groom had put so much time and energy into setting it out and thoughtfully placed every spot that she actually stood there frozen. Before she could say anything else, the head waiter with this book motioned to somebody beside him and said, will you kindly escort them through the kitchen to the service elevator? They followed him. She said they walked through all the food that was prepared. They had ice sculptures blowing water out of these fish and stuff, and it was just like fancy food. She could smell the filet mignon. She could smell all the smoked trout and all these incredible gifts that were about to be open, landy tables. And she was walking to her with her husband, past all the frivolity, and they took her through the kitchen. This big service elevator opened up. They were escorted in, and the gentleman reached in and hit G for garage. Didn't step in the elevator. The doors closed, and the elevator dropped. This is what she said next. As Roy and I drove out of the Columbia Tower garage, we both sat in stunned silence. After driving several miles, my husband gently reached over, put his hand on my arm, and just simply said, Sweetheart, what happened? And then I remembered. When the invitation arrived for the reception, I was so busy with life that I never bothered to return the RSVP. Besides, I'm the singer. Everybody knows me. Surely I could go to a reception without returning this formality. And as they said, as we drove on further, I actually began to cry, and then I began to weep. I wasn't weeping because I had just missed the most incredible banquet of my life. I was weeping because suddenly I knew what it will be like someday for people as they stand before the Lord People who were too busy to respond to Christ's invitation to sit at the heavenly banquet. 
People who assume they had done good things. People who may have even served in church or been on leadership or had perfect attendance or played in a band or served in the nursery, thinking that would be good enough. I could work my way in. But Revelation tells us that many people will look for their name in the Lamb's book of life and will not find it there. And Jesus will reply, depart from me. I never knew you. People did not return his gracious RSVP. Then she said, then I wept again because I was so grateful that I had. Many years earlier, surrendered my life to Christ, acknowledged him as personal Savior and Lord, and now I have confidence that my name is written in the most important book of all, the Lamb's Book of Life. You see, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. No one goes there by accident. The time to meet the Lord is in this life, not the next. Wow. Ruth Anna knew her name was in the Lamb's Book of Life. What about you? What about you listening at home? Have you been so caught up in the world and busy in life and, you're, and the things, and you never really, you know, I know about God, but I don't think I know Him? You could change that today. I've been there. So busy in my own world, so focused right here. Can I pray for you? Everywhere you are, if you're in this room, let's just bow. If you're at home, just close your eyes and just take a moment to tune out the distractions. Pour out your heart to the Father. Father, we are so thankful that you provided a way to overcome our sin. Taking a punishment you didn't even deserve. Father, we read your word. We know the Holy Scriptures. We know that sin has separated us from you and your word tells us to repent and believe. Lord, we do that here and now. We believe you are who you say you are. We believe that you and your shed blood can cover our sin and make us white as snow. God, I thank you for that promise that whoever believes and confesses you as Lord will be saved. We stand on that. We claim the promise that we can be made a new creation. Holy Spirit, would you invade our life? Take over. We surrender. We've made a mess of things. From this day on, Lord, we want you to be Lord and Master. May we live for you every day, walking in light away from the darkness. Thank you for your promises. We stand on them. They are our foundation, and we cling to you. We love you. Thank you for saving us from ourself and from sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.